thank you for having me. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here and talking to so many young people who are interested in birds. I'm delighted to talk about birds. I would never leave an opportunity for that. So I've seen the program. It seems like we are in the week nine and everybody has a very nice dose of ecology, evolution, social behavior, mating behavior, all kinds of things related to birds. And what I'm trying to do today is trying to combine all of that from the disease perspective. Um, I'm gonna give a brief introduction of different diseases which birds usually have, but then I will dip into a couple of diseases which are really prevalent in birds and some have been a really cause of extinctions for many species. So one of the very interesting thing which comes to anybody who's interested in birds is that why should you bother about studying diseases in birds? Uh, well, the answer for that is uh, very simple because birds are such a highly mobile animals and they do move around, they migrate to long distances. So it becomes a real concern that they must be or might be carrying parasites of different nature with them, could be bacterial, protozoan, viruses with them. And given the scenario we are living in right now for the last two years in pandemic, it might come to some people's head that do they, can they be carrier for COVID virus, for example? Well, well, they don't, but can they be carrier for other zoonotic diseases? So from that perspective, are they reservoir for different pathogens? So when you look at this diversity of species that we have in birds, they do harbor a huge diversity of parasites as well. But having said that, most of them are pretty host specific, which means they tend not to jump from other host species like to mammals or others. So for example, uh, the screen which you are looking right now here. So this particular pigeon, uh, Columbidae family, you are looking at this bird with a, a mouth, a beak or whole mouth is full of these yellowish parasites. It's called trichomonosis. It's a disease caused by some protozoan parasites. And once it infects the birds, they tend to stop feeding for a while and then they die. This has been a real cause of decline in green finches populations in United Kingdom. So more than 70, 80% birds have declined because of that. And it has jumped from other uh, basically socially feeding birds, you know, where they tend to feed on the same feeders and this is how they contract infection. So this is about the birds which are feeding socially, but then there are birds which get infected with parasites, which could be transmitted by a, so say different insect species or like in cases mosquitoes. So for example, this is a West Nile virus for which you need a very competent species of mosquito. And this is here where you have, birds are actually the reservoir for these viruses and they can jump to humans. And it's very prevalent in uh, North America. Then there's something called avian pox, which is again a, a viral disease. And birds tend to develop these kinds of, uh, you know, protuberances with kind of patches where they stop, it could be over eyes, could be over the beak, where they can't see or feed and then lead to their uh, the death. Or it, and it's very prevalent again in North America and in, in UK as well. Now, the other disease which is very common, which I'll be talking in detail is about this malaria in birds, which is pretty similar to what we get in humans and it is transmitted by mosquito species. So when you look at this spectrum of species, I mean, in some cases, as I said, birds act as a amplifier host, which means they are reservoir. They don't die of these infections. They have evolved with these parasites, but this cycle sort of tends to happen between a dead end host where they sort of amplify and they do get infected on and off having these competent mosquitoes. So in this case is this Culex cunciaciatus, which is also very common in India. And it's one of the key vector species for filaria uh, here. And the interesting thing is that once it's called dead end host because when it infects like humans or hair, it shows like a, um, a horse, they cannot transmit to any other, a third host species. So that's where the cycle stops. And that's what we call a kind of a spillover infection. Now, as in case of SARS-CoV-2, you must have heard this term several times that it has been spilled over, say, from other animals or it has now has become 
uh, causing problem and even can be transmitted from one human to the other. And that's where the problem happens. So and that's where a disease can become a real pandemic. And that's what we all are living. So imagine if you have a West Nile virus and it evolves in certain way, and then it starts to infect even without needing a host, then it can become a different level of scale of pandemic. Then there are other problems associated with birds where, for example, you have very high uh, prevalent these pigeons all over the cities and here they are not transmitting any disease, but you know, wherever the ledges and all where they sit or they have their, um, the breeding uh, sites, the, the, the poop of these species, they usually, the dust when people inhale that can cause kind of lung fibrosis, which can be very deadly too. And it's quite prevalent these days. Then there is something called psittacosis, which is only prevalent in most of these uh, the parakeets or other macaws, which are basically in the cage species, which tend to live uh, closely together. And again, if you are exposed to these birds for a long, people who keep aviaries and all, or if you go to a pet market, if you're exposed, it can cause lung infections. So there are diseases which birds live with, they don't cause any problem in them, but we can get infected, but there are others which they also die of. Now, from a conservation perspective, when the reason I got interested in this disease word is because when you look at the uh, information of that, what could be the reasons for decline of these bird populations or extinction, a lot of people talk about habitat degradation or population growth or even pollution. And from South Asia perspective, I guess you guys must have heard of this veterinary drug, which was introduced in late, uh, late 90s, where this led to the decline of this gyps versus population. But disease actually with respect to climate change has not surfaced in so much, but this is becoming a real issue and we don't have much information related to that. And if you think about birds and the spread of the disease, the one thing which comes, which I'm sure you guys have understood a lot, lot about the migration ecology, migration comes into mind that when they're going from say wintering ground to the breeding ground or the seasonal movement, do they carry these parasites and what might be driving this kind of cycle or annual movement every year? So there are a lot of uh, studies which have been done and people say the reason birds migrate, uh, it could be because the conditions where they have been breeding, the, it becomes intolerant or the, it's too cold uh, for them to live. So that's why they have to move to a suitable habitat in order to exploit uh, good food resources. But also the reason for the birds to, to, to move from one place to the other is also to escape diseases. And this has been studied a lot. And actually it's been showed that migrant species, uh, which uh, tend to have a very high diversity of immune genes compared to the resident counterparts of the say, same group of birds. It's because they are exposed to both parasites. So they have evolved to live with those different spectrum of parasites. Now, from a disease ecology perspective, when you look at this thing, it's very interesting because it's just not a interaction of a parasite or a host. It's the environment or the kind of uh, place they are living, it could be the biotic, combination of biotic and abiotic features, which actually drive the interaction between host and parasites, and also ecology, which could be driving the evolution of different parasites. So what birds are carrying, it's basically could be influenced by where they live, where they are feeding, how socially they are interacting with other species, and what they are exposed to at certain time of year. And this is where this migration flyways plays a very huge role. So as you know, I mean, India falls into this Central Asian flyway and we get good number of migrant species, but that's just not the migration uh, happens here. Migration also happens, which can bring or expose birds to different parasites. So for example, I'll, I'll just talk about this in briefly, what kind of transmission dynamics uh, from the parasite perspective can happen. So, as I said, there are parasites which doesn't require any host. So, which is like the viruses, they can just uh, jump from one host to the other. And they tend not to be very host specific as well. So all they rely on the contact rate and the mutation happens and one after the other, they can infect 
different species. So for example, avian influenza, and you usually hear, hear about these outbreaks say, in poultry or um, in big lakes where you have large, large congregation of these uh, migrant birds are there. And you hear that there have been thousands of birds have been found dead because of the avian influenza. But then there are also parasites, as I said, for the vector bond, which is which quite a, a significant number of these vector species to transmit the parasite. So you can have n number of birds infected with malaria, but until or unless you have a specific, say mosquito or insect host, which can transmit that parasite or in a certain number, that transmission cycle will not finish or will not take place. And that's what we call a frequency dependent uh, transmission. So I'll, I'll dip into this first aspect of this, uh, the frequency dependent, which is the avian malaria parasite and why it is so important to understand both, not just from birds perspective, but also from human point of view, because it's a very closely related to what we also harbor in, in our country. So when we talk about avian malaria, I mean, as we all must have got it at some point because we live in India. And as so for example, in humans, you have, Plasmodium species, which is responsible for the malaria cycle, but in birds, the diversity is huge and it can be caused by a group of this genus parasite belonging to Plasmodium, which is transmitted by these mosquitoes. There could be uh, hemoproteus parasites, which is transmitted by these culicoides, which are also very tiny little insects and usually tend to congregate or breed in near areas where you have livestock basically. And the third group is this leukocytosome, which affects uh, usually the white blood cells, and it is transmitted by the black flies. Now, the transmission cycle of all these three parasites is pretty similar, except only the infections hard, uh, coming from plasmodium parasites are referred to as malaria, and the rest of the two are called malaria-like parasites. And the reason being that plasmodium parasites are quite lethal, actually, in infection, and they tend to stay in the red blood cells, so they're very uh, surface uh, uh, or very exposed in terms of that a parasite can be easily transmitted when it's circulating in the blood. As opposed to these two, they appear only uh, when the breeding cycle is over and they are ready to be transmitted. So they usually are found in the tissues of the, in, of the, of the birds. And rest of the cycle stays the same. And if you think about in terms of how this disease affect the birds, it affects a bird in terms of it, uh, the birds which say have high infection of these malaria in a certain populations, it can reduce their reproductive success. So they tend not to have very large brood or very interrupted cycle. Uh, it affects their body condition. So birds which have, um, so, so you know how they, um, they feed, how they live in a habitat, it affects their the growth or their general makes them lethargic or exposed to even more different infections or, or diseases. The birds which have high infection throughout their life, they also tend to have, uh, they don't live longer. So it affects their uh, uh, lifespan. But in very, very extreme cases, if the birds have never been exposed to these blood-borne parasites, it can lead to mort mortality. And this is what I found it very interesting when I started studying these, uh, this disease is, is in the Hawaii Islands, which is a, an archipelago just very close to off the coast of North America, where you have a lot of endemic species, but these birds have evolved without any uh, exposure to any malarial or any vector borne or a blood borne parasite. So, just to understand in terms of evolution, you know, how a species, why a species can live with a parasite and others can die. This is a very living example, which people have seen happening through in their lifetime. So these Hawaiian islands, basically they have, they are, these are very old and they have initially been colonized by Polynesians. And then you have, uh, um, around 17th or 18th century, you have Europeans which arrive and they colonize these islands and they were using these for trade and all kinds of businesses. And because of the human colonization, they brought pigs and poultry, but they also were bringing ships and things with them, which brought mosquitoes. And first account of mosquito for this Culex species, Culex fasciatus, which is the same species, by the way, which transmit West Nile virus, 
was accidentally introduced on these islands. And in the same time, they were also introduction of these birds from different parts of the world, including Africa, India, and, and the reason being that the birds, the Europeans which were living there, they were kind of bored of looking at just those endemic birds. So they wanted to feel at home. So they introduced lots of bulbuls, leothrix, um, jungle fowl, cardinals, and white eyes, just to make it feel at home. But what if that happened in that process, a lot of these birds which were introduced in several bouts, they also brought malarial parasite with them. Now, remember these birds lived, they have survived, they have lived with these parasites. These are just reservoir for these parasites. But with this accidental introduction of mosquito, what happened was that this mosquito was a perfect host for some of these parasites which these birds were carrying. And one of those parasites was Plasmodium relictum which was very lethal for the endemic birds on these islands and led to something like 90, more than 90% of mortality or some of the species even got extinct. So this is a very living example. It's a textbook example of that what malaria can cause, what a species introduction or a disease introduction can lead to uh, extinction of some of the species. And just to give you in a very schematic way, so Hawaiian islands are on an elevational gradient. So you have sea level all the way up to 2000 meter. So most of the mosquito species, they show a negative correlation with the island. So as you go higher up in the mountains, you don't see any mosquito species. And most of the native birds have shifted on the high elevation just to escape these parasites because this is where most of the introduced birds are living, which still harbor parasites. So endemic birds have tend to shift it a bit. So they don't, so just in order to escape these parasites. But what I hear now, it's been more than 20, 30 years uh, when the birds were dying immediately after being affected. But now the coevolution has set in place. Birds don't just immediately die. They tend to get sick and then they sort of recover. So it's not a quick reaction. So their body has tend to acclimatize with the presence of some uh, from, from these the parasites. Now, studying this system makes you think that why only Hawaii has ever had this system, why it never happened in any other part of the world, or could there be places in the, in the world where, where birds have never been exposed to these kind of parasites, or could there be a system which is waiting for this kind of eruption to happen where you have an accidental introduction of these parasites or mosquito happen. And that's where our system for Himalaya makes it a very good location where you have a fantastic migration system where you have a set of birds which come down every winter in southern, in the peninsular India, but not everything comes down. So the birds which are here, they are exposed to a large number of parasites and mosquitoes and the ones over here, they are not. So the idea here is that when these ones go back and they breed, they share the common breeding ground. And this is a breeding ground if you have a competent mosquito species and parasites if these birds have carried, that's where you have a transmission of parasite happen, assuming that, that other environmental condition and everything is also perfect. And this is a very intriguing system in a way that to design a study for a bird migration, you need to understand more about the bird migration, but also to understand the parasite biology also here. What time of year should you be sampling birds so you can find parasite in them? Because as I said, some parasites tend to live in the blood, some could hide in the tissues. And that's the time is, as you can see the cycle here, that this is the cycle when the birds are very, the parasitemia is really prevalent in the blood. Most of the time it's in the latent phase. So if you sample the birds, you may or may not, it's the chronic infections. It's, it's a very low kind of infection. So unless it's in the blood, you will find it. So the way to do it is in the breeding time. If you catch the birds in the breeding season, most of them have very suppressed immune response and because they're putting so much effort on their reproductive hormones, so their immunity is really low. And most of the parasitemia, if they are infected, it will be showing in their blood. And that's how we designed this work. We wanted to understand what kind of gradient of parasites do you see in a high elevation species versus a very low elevation species. So this is a spectrum of species which we have been looking into. As you can see in the phylogeny, all the resident birds have been marked in the, in the red and the elevational migrants which move up and down with the change in the weather, they are marked in the black lines. And the lines basically just show you the distribution range with respect to dotted, which is the non-breeding season. So for example, this species of a warbler is found in the non-breeding season up to this range. 
but it shifts in the breeding time only in these elevations. So, which means if we are sampling these bird in the breeding time, most of them should be found here in this range. So we study these birds to understand what kind of different parasites they carry, what would be the prevalence, which is if you sample a certain number of birds, what proportion of that would be infected, what different kinds of parasites would they have been? Is there a difference between migrants and residents? Just the basic questions to understand what could be driving the parasite diversity in these birds. And there's a spectrum of sites. So you, if you want to understand how the gradient changes, you need to do this study at a different elevation as well. So starting from very low elevation environment, something like 600 meters, all the way going to a high elevation, something like say 3000 meter. So you go there, you mark the birds using these uh, unique uh, rings. Um, you take little blood samples. You also make slides, which is a very traditional way of understanding the morphology of the parasites. But the blood helps us to understand the molecular marker. So you can do a PCR, you know, amplify the DNA of the parasite and understand what kind of genetic diversity of parasite. But we are also taking information on their uh, body condition, their weight, and uh, do they have any sign of brood patch or other, other basically morphometrics of these birds. And this is a very traditional way of doing microscopy, which is sort of dying out now, but this is the best way to tell if the parasite is also was in the breeding phase or was it just a spillover uh, kind of infection. And then we also do something called, because we are dealing with high elevation birds and to understand what kind of hemoglobin they are carrying, because in high elevation environment, most of the birds are in a very low oxygen pressure. So this helps us to understand, is it any variation in the birds in which are in the low oxygen environment? If they are infected, does it affect their capacity to hold oxygen or is it fine as the birds, which is birds which are not infected? So the one way to, to do it is a, it's a kind of machine, which HemoQ, which helps you. You put a little drop of the blood and it tells you what could be hemoglobin of that particular bird. And we also do a hematocrit, which is basically just the, the level of uh, hemoglobin concentration in their blood. You just have to spin it. It separates the plasma from the different erythrocytes and leukocytes. And then if you, as I said, malaria is a three piece jigsaw puzzle. You just can't rely on a bird and a parasite. You need to understand mosquitoes as well, which might be living in these environments. So to understand that, we sample mosquitoes as well. And these environments where we are studying these birds, they do get uh, a, a huge population of uh, migrants. So this is one of our Blight Street popular. We get the global population of this bird in, in, in India, which travels through these most of these North Indian, this Himalayan habitat. So you see uh, some of the migrant species. So the habitats are, are utilized by migrant birds. And this is an, another uh, migrant species, a Palearctic one, which is common rose finch, which also winters in India, but it shares its habitat with these two resident birds in the Himalaya. So what I'm trying to tell you that in the breeding ground, when we are sampling these birds, these birds are not just with the elevational migrants, which have been to the down south here. These are also har uh, sharing this habitat with some of these long distance migrant. So if you have the right condition and right vector species, there could be a transmission of parasites taking place. So ecology can drive these interactions in a very small uh, space uh, and time as well. So when we do PCRs in these birds, we say you've done n number of species, it tells you what proportion of birds are infected and then you can plot it to understand how that changes with the season. So a lot of studies when people do, they uh, and around the globe, especially in the uh, temp temperate areas, say for example, UK or even in some parts of US, they show there's a kind of seasonality in the, uh, in the uh, prevalence of the birds. So the birds are more infected there in the summer or and less in the winter, which obviously because of winter, you don't have many mosquito species around. But this is the data set I'm showing you just to signify this effect that in our country, in India, if you are in a very warm environment, there is no variation. Parasite is there pretty much throughout the year. So this is just to make this point. However, if you look at the same trend for a high elevation environment, this is for plasmodium. This is the elevation I'm showing you here on the X axis. And this is the prevalence of the parasite. It shows a negative correlation with the elevation. So which means as you go up higher in the mountain, the prevalence of plasmodium goes down and it makes perfect sense because you don't see mosquitoes in the cold environment because they can't survive. 
And this also reflects in a very small proportion of birds are infected with also with, as a result with the parasite, both for the resident birds and as well as for the uh, elevational migrant. And the same trend is mirrored in this hemoproteus parasites, which is transmitted by this culicoides, which again is a negative correlation. So which means cold environment neither support the vector species and nor the parasite. So basically the psychology of this area or how the, the temperature gradient is, is driving the presence and absence of these parasites in these birds. Now this gets a bit interesting when you look at a third parasite species with a group, which is the leukocytosome. It shows a negative trend in elevational migrant, but for resident species, which are living there throughout the year, it shows a very positive correlation, which means the birds which are in high elevation environment, they tend to have high proportion of leukocytosome. And you know why? Because black flies, they breed in those cold streams in the, in the mountains. So the more you have these vector species, there could be transmission of these parasites, or at least birds can sustain these parasites longer in their system. So, and it's a very highly prevalent as well. It's more than 40% of the birds which I have screened there, they have been infected. So what it signifies that just by looking at the, even if you do not sample, uh, say, vector species, these mosquitoes, culicoidal, or black flies, just by looking at the proportion of birds which are infected in your population, you can tell which vector group is more active in your area or which is driving these kind of patterns in a bird population. And then there's an aspect of host specificity. As I said, viruses can jump because being a vector parasite, transmit parasite, you would expect this could also be very uh, not so host specific because you require that kind of, uh, you know, mosquito species to transmit these parasites. But this is a homoproteus by parasite phylogeny I'm showing you. What it tells you, see each clade here, so as we said, is a phylogenetic tree, which is of the parasite species. And what it shows you that each clade of these parasites, which are closely related, they're also closely related and found in the specific bird group. So this is, for example, our laughing thrushes. They tend to have their own specific parasites, which are not found in other species. Same for this black bird group. And then you have these um, uh, black-throated tits, you have barbates, you have white eyes. So they tend to carry their own kinds of vector, uh, these hemoproteus parasites. This is not the trend in plasmodium, which jumps from one species to the other. Now, the interesting thing for me was to understand here was what kind of percent of birds show a spillover with a long distance migrant or with any other resident species. So this is, for example, is a particular clade I found in these uh, blind seed wobbler, which I showed you earlier, which is a, um, a, a paleartic migrant, which comes from Europe or Central Asia and breed and winter here. It carries its own very specific group parasites, and I, we found like some of the spillover happening in some of these uh, laughing thrushes or, or babblers here. But these were the dead end hosts. There were no sign of active or uh, gametocyte in the blood. Having said that, the rose finches, which have, we, have, we have sampled there, they tend to share a lot of those parasites, which are active infectious in these resident Himalayan birds. So it shows you. What it signifies that if you have more closely related species in a population and if you're sharing that habitat, the transmission of parasite becomes easier as opposed to distantly related parasite species. And this has been shown repeatedly over and over again that parasites which are very host specific if they are colonizing in new areas and if you have a phylogenetically related host species, their transmission or their colonization becomes easier as opposed to the ones which require a specific host it sort of interrupts their cycle. And it makes sense that what drives their evolution and success of colonizing new host and new habitat as well. Now, this was from the host perspective. The parasite also, you, what you find also are quite, you can see a pattern here where the birds feed according to the feeding spectrum, also by their social behavior. So for example, birds which forage on the, uh, say in the higher strata of the forest, they tend to have their own kinds of parasites as opposed to the ones which are feeding in the lower grounds. And again, it's all driven by the vector species because some of the spe vector species, they tend to like a higher canopy of the, of the forest. And again, with the social behavior, which I just showed you that uh, the babblers and the laughing thrushes, they tend to have a high prevalence of parasites as opposed to which, uh, which could be living in a mixed species flock versus the ones which are living solitary. <clears throat> 
Now, malaria, in, in, in this, is, this is the data all I'm showing you. It's from Himalayan birds, very specific to the, these birds. Birds which are, this is a particular group of birds in finches, which we found they, that they do tend to affect their body condition as well. So we measure their body condition by measuring their, say, wing length and the tarsus length, and you take a, a regression for that and residuals of that, you plot that against the infection status, how many birds are infected and how many are uninfected. And what this shows you that a large proportion of birds which are uninfected, they are slightly in better body conditions than the, world, the ones which were in the uh, where they were infected. And here again, uh, we look into the physiological stress, which might be caused by the presence of these parasites. So even though some of these species have co-evolved with these parasites, having a high proportion of certain lineage of parasites or species can put a lot of stress on these birds. And what it shows you that the birds which are infected here, they tend to have a negative correlation with the, with, with terms of the uh, HL ratio, which is the actually the ratio of the heterophils and, uh, and leukocytes in their blood. Now, since I'm talking about the mount, mountain birds, uh, as I just said, that a lot of mountain birds, they are exposed to the changing oxygen condition. So if you think of it this way, that when you go to a high elevation environment, if you go suddenly, say, to Leh Ladakh or high Himalayan region, you... Some people cope very well, some feel very oxygen deprived, and it takes them a while to acclimatize with that level of oxygen, because as you go higher up, the oxygen pressure drops. Now, this also works for birds as well. I mean, you know, Sherpas, for example, they hike and they go around, say, in Nepal without any problem, because they have certain set of genes which allows them to cope with that kind of pressure very well, as opposed to a person living in the plain areas. So we need to tend to stay for a few, say, days to acclimatize condition, and then we can go for hikes and enjoy that environment. It's the same thing for the birds as well. The birds which live in the plains, they have a certain different level of how they cope with this uh, change in oxygen pressure as opposed to the mountain birds, which have a certain set of genes, which allows them to, to cope with this. Now, the thing which I was really interested in understanding here is that the birds which tend to fluctuate there or can uh, regulate their oxygen condition, when they get infected with these parasites, how do they cope with this thing? Because the bird the parasite is also utilizing the same environment, which is the blood cell. And this is the same cell, which is helping them to up or down regulate their oxygen levels as well. So for, for example, imagine here, you have a bird species, which is migrated down, which say it's a rose finch or uh, some finch in Himalaya. And here in the low elevation, the oxygen pressure is pretty good. And then the species goes up where it is breeding now. Here, the, the, the pressure oxygen has dropped down. And imagine if this bird is also infected with parasite. And now this, has, this species has to upregulate its hemoglobin, also hematocrit, in order to cope with this changing oxygen condition. Now, if this bird is infected with, a, say, certain level, uh, kinds of parasites, will it be able to cope with these? And in the face of climate change, if they have not been exposed, this can cause a real problem. Now, these are very intricate um, uh, experiments in a sense, just doing it on wild birds probably doesn't give a very clear picture, but just to try and understand what might be happening in the wild, we went and sampled these birds for all kinds of parameters, which included the hemoglobin, hematocrit, and different kinds of parasites and parasite intensity as well. And what we found that uh, in terms of just having uh, hemoglobin or hematocrit, they do tend to show a positive correlation, which means only elevation migraine, they tend to upregulate their oxygen condition, but not the residents because they don't have to, they have lived in this environment. They don't have to uh, move up and down or they, they've been evolved with these conditions as opposed to elevation migrant, when they come down and they go up, they, they show this tendency. But what interesting we found that if you see a spectrum of bird species, Irrespective of what, the most of the elevational migrants, when they have a very high intensity infection and also mixed infection, say with plasmodium parasites or leukocytosome parasites, they tend to show a very low hemoglobin concentration in their blood. Now, this is just a random sample which we have tested here, which shows this kind of pattern. This doesn't mean, necessarily mean that the birds are dying of these infections. But it just shows you a trend. I think if we do a much regulated experiments in the field and test it further, it probably will give us a better picture that what might be 
going down with their hemoglobin fluctuation and also with respect to parasites. Now, coming to the, the part of the vector species, as I, as I said, it's a three-piece jigsaw puzzle. We also want to understand what's going out with the vector abundance. And as we think that if temperature is driving the parasite uh, prevalence in these birds, it does drive the emergence of these different vector species in this environment. And most of the vector species show a negative uh, relationship with the elevation. So as you go higher up, you don't tend to see many vector species. And somewhere here, this time of year, you see a peak in the, the vector time when these, bird, when these uh, mosquitoes or different vector species emerge. Now, we wanted to understand how that relates to the breeding time of the birds, because somewhere between April and May in the Himalayan birds, they breed and vector emergence is happening somewhere here. So we wanted to know how, what proportion of birds are exposed to these interactions in this environment. And what that would mean in, in terms of uh, uh, climate change. Uh, So what I'm showing you here is that the parasite cycle, for example, for the, whether it's a human malaria parasite or avian malaria parasites, they are very heavily dependent on temperature. There has to be a threshold of temperature below which or above which the parasite transmission or development will not take place. So which means if you take a temperature of certain areas or certain habitat over a period of time, you can predict what parasite can be uh, there given that all the conditions are right, that you have a right host species or a vector species present in that environment. So to understand this better from a climate change and parasite transmission perspective, we did the study and all we did was we put some loggers, you know, these temperature loggers in different elevation environment to record the temperature throughout the year at half an hour interval. And what we found, which was really true that most of these high elevation sites, they cannot transmit any parasite, neither human malaria nor bird malaria parasite. And as you go down the elevation, which is say something like 2,600 meter, with respect to temperature, only some of the parasites, they can be transmitted only some of the time of year, but not throughout all the time of year. But if you keep going down to the low elevation environment, the transmission becomes possible. So what it shows you that when we predict it in terms of climate change model, what it shows is that, say, maybe in 30 years from today, some of these, these sites may still be not transmitting parasite, but some of them become conducive for parasite transmission. And what that means in terms of, say, bird species which are changing their range with the change in temperature or with the habitat change, they'll be more exposed to the parasites. And with, say, doing a lot of monitoring for bird population or understanding what kind of parasite diversity is there in these environments, we can predict what those species will be first affected by this kind of change in the environment, which may not just be driven by uh, such habitat change, but could be with respect to disease and caused by a temperature change in these environment. So that's the value of this work. And it can also help us to understand how hemo human malaria might be, say, going uh, upwards with the Himalayan region where it is not found at the moment. Now, I just want to dip into a little bit on this avian influenza uh, system, which is I briefly touched upon earlier on the, from the perspective of directly transmitted parasites. And you all must have heard bird flu, which happens every other year in India. And let's just understand what is happening in the ecology of this particular uh, group of viruses which birds are carrying. So birds, most of the birds which are here, I mean, wild birds, they carry some kind of virus. I mean, most of them have evolved with these low path viruses. And some of them, if they have not been exposed, and if there's a new combination of virus appears in the nature, they tend to die. And it, that's what, because of this becomes a high path pathogenic virus. And that's what we call as a high uh, path flu or a bird flu. And this can happen in different combinations. So you have a uh, HA or any combination of different uh, genes which can occur, H5 or H9, where the birds can be found and it can be lethal to them. Now, in terms of this wild birds, which might be carrying them, as everybody thinks they do, it's, it actually usually coincides with the arrival of the birds, which arrive in, in, say, with the migration time. So these birds, when they arrive, there's lots of ducks and geese, mostly the barhead geese over here, and they 
tend to spend time in a lot of wetlands, which may be at the interface of say some poultry farms or in the villages. And when they're carrying these high path viruses, they either spillover happen to the resident birds, or it could be that two different kinds of viruses, they combine, the kind of recombination happen and it can affect the third host, could be a, a, a pig or something else. And then that's where you have a swine flu kind of eruption taking space. So this is how the virus mutates and they form new kinds of lethal or say sublethal versions of it. And it leads to, it can infect species which may not have been exposed to this. And that's, you see a mass mortality in that particular group of birds. So now what's my, and you, this, is, you, this is the last year's map of uh, avian influenza virus, which pretty much started evolving, say somewhere here in this part of the world. And, and it finally came to India. And it, it happened here, it, uh, it caused a, a big havoc. But before I go into that, I just want to explain something very interesting about this whole avian influenza thing here. So this is somewhere here is, uh, this is all the, uh, uh, the, the China here, this is Mongolia over here. And Mongolia is a very interesting place from avian influenza point of view. It's the setting of it is just perfect for studying this particular disease in birds. If you can actually draw the whole map of Mongolia by looking at the poultry distribution in countries around this country, because Mongolia, as you know, if you must, if you can read about it, it's basically a nomadic uh, kind of culture or people live there. They tend to have these big lakes or they have gear camp where people live. They tend to have a lot of horses and they just move with the season. But it's also a very fine network of these salt water lakes, which attracts a lot of ducks and geese every year as a <clears throat> breeding site, say from China, when they come and they breed here. And that's where you see a, a, a wild bird outbreak of avian influenza in these. So we did a study to understand how what extent these birds are affected by this uh, different kinds of avian influenza viruses. So all we were doing like a passive survey around the shores of these lakes, looking at the duck poops, or if we find a dead bird, we were sort of doing necropsy for this, figuring out what organs are affected and taking a sample in a minus 80, you know, or thing to, so that it can be processed later. And we found like shell ducks or swans, they were the main species which were affected by, by this um, H5N1 uh, virus at the time. Now, usually when you have these kind of outbreaks happening uh, in Mongolia, they also coincide with some poultry outbreaks in China in, uh, at the same time. And this also coincides with the migration of some of these bar-headed geese. Actually, we get a large, pretty much all global population here in India, as you saw very nicely by this bird count India uh, map. We attract pretty much all the population here. And some of the bar-headed geese, when they are, say, could be carrier of these high path viruses, or they must just be sick, but they do fly all the way from there to India. And they, they, so say, say they are wintering somewhere here in this part in Himachal, some lake, and they're shedding virus all the time in that area in, on the lake reservoir. And you have other species of birds using the same habitat. And that's how the infection transmit from one bird, one community to the other, and you see a mass mortality. And that's when you hear reports of birds dying of malaria, of, of the human influenza. This is the map which I prepared based on the data collected by Bird Count India last year as the, as the avian flu was reported in the country. All the dates show where the birds were dying. So for example, here 5,000 birds first time were found dead in the Pong Dam. And then gradually it spreads to all kinds of species, not just the ducks and geese, but it's a spectrum of species. For example, crows, the lapwings, and all kinds of birds were found dead. And it was just not H5N1, it was H5N8. Now, for me, it's a huge number of species. And then the first response we had was that they will start to cull poultry because poultry are the big concentration camp once you have one chicken infected with these virus, it's a non-stop cycle. And the only way to stop is to cull the birds to stop the transmission. Otherwise, it's a big industry. It affects the whole business. Now, interesting thing about this map, which I want to highlight, I'm calling this all potential avian influenza cases in India because not all the cases, all the dead birds were tested for the virus. So it was potentially died of these viruses. And I think most likely they were. And I'll tell you reasons for that in a bit why uh, could be a problem why we don't know what might be happening on the ground. So 
it's very easy to say that migrant birds are responsible for spreading the avian influenza in, in India. And a lot of time when it happens, it happens, people say it's a migrant bird coming in the country. And that's what they are bringing these high path viruses, which is not actually true. If you, so first of all, avian influenza, whenever you have high path cases in the country or anywhere in the world, it's a notifiable disease. They have, the government have to report them. It has to be logged into an OIA system. They have to test it and they have to actually tell the name of the virus. And all the dots on the map, which I'm showing you are here, these are the dots which have, where the outbreaks have happened in the, in, the, in, the, in the different season here. But all the blue dots, they have happened in the non-migrant season. So which means even though you have some outbreaks happening in the high season, which I call is, is the migrant season, there also has been endemic transmission of virus going on, which was lethal to the poultry in the non-migratory season as well. So what it tells you that it's just not the migrant species. There are actually strains or the kinds of viruses which are lethal to the poultry, which are become endemic in nature and they are causing problem to the, to the, to, to the poultry, which leads to the culling of these birds. And the only difference is that you don't hear about it because it's a non-migrant time. And so those outbreaks happen and they cull the birds and the business starts as usual after that. So it's just not the migrant bird which are responsible for these outbreaks. Now, one of the questions which anyone should be asking that why do you see these outbreaks more happening now and as opposed to they used to happen before? Because even influenza has been around for a while. I mean, the first outbreak which we have seen or reported case was in 2006 in India. And that was when China also has been reporting. And the one of the reasons which I think is that our poultry industry has grown a lot. It has become a very, uh, I would say, uh, growing in a business. It's very lucrative. Government has given a lot of schemes. It works very well for everybody. But the problem is that people are not following the guidelines. So it's like, as I said, if the number or congregation attracts a virus, they, they got to be some kind of regulation that this is the certain number of birds you can have. So you can stop the cycle. But it's not so well regulated at the moment. So what it leads to, a lot of habitats, wetlands have been converted for because of urbanization pressure. So there's a shrinking of habitat. So wild waterfowls, which used to go and congregate in those traditional wetlands, now they're kind of mixing with the poultry. And there's a lot of interactions happening with the wild birds and the, the poultry. There's an increased density of the farms and there is an increased density of the chickens as well. And on top of that, we have next to nothing in terms of biosecurity, we don't test or do any kind of surveillance. The only time our response is that when there is a outbreak, we just cull the birds, which is actually just not the answer. In order to understand what is floating in a population and what's happening, you need to do a proper surveillance to understand what kind of viruses are uh, poultry versus the wild bird might be carrying or exposed to, so we can prepare better for this kind of outbreaks in the in the future. And Luckily, in India, we don't have a tradition of having, uh, say, live market or anything, but people do sell and buy kind of uh, illegal birds. I mean, there are a lot of bird trade goes on, and which could be a hub for bringing, say, some of these zoonotic or some different kind of bird species. So the point I'm making here is that a lot of work which I do it's all started with a kind of unknown idea just to understand what kind of virus, say virus or birds or parasites might be infecting these birds. So it's just a basic surveillance which can be combined with the ecology of the species and understand what kind of environment to make this picture, picture much clearer to understand the, the scenario of what we are living in. And I would not uh, say it lightly now for anyone that the answer for anyone in today's world when we live in is to increase our surveillance, whether it's an active surveillance or passive surveillance. I understand that in case of birds, it is slightly can be difficult because birds are such a you know, mobile uh, animals. Not everybody's trained in catching the birds. You have to sample, you need permissions. But you see, there is a way of doing passive surveillance as well. You can go and test the habitat, looking into their excreta, you can look into the areas around the lake, testing them for different pathogens and understanding what kind of, say, viral or other pathogens might be there in the environment. So there are lots of ways one can account and understand the picture, what is happening on, and then take it to the, a bit notch up to understand what might be happening in the 
host species. So with this, I'm going to stop here. And I think it would be nice if you guys have questions. I'll be very happy to answer. So I'm not the only one talking here. So uh, I'll thank you. And Devika, over to you. I'll be happy to take questions if there are in the, uh, with the group. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Farah. That was a great, great session. Uh, learned a lot about avian diseases today. Yeah. Uh, so maybe Jobin will help us in uh, with the questions. Jobin is at TA Farah. So um, maybe he can read out. We have got one question as so far in the chat box. Okay. And uh, if there are any more questions, please uh, go ahead and uh, all for all participants, you can enter your questions in the chat box. Jobin, uh, over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, hi, Farah. Uh, hi. Yeah. So uh, I hope the network is uh, not so bad. So the first question is uh, there in the chat box. So, so they're asking, um, so, okay. So they're asking if all the, uh, so the, uh, the all the accessible literature and I'll read it. I think on, uh, it's slightly if, patchy. Yeah, I'll read it. Yeah. Uh, it's limited to Hawaiian Island. Is, is what they're saying. Uh, or it's mostly available from Hawaii, Hawaiian Island. Is it uh, uh, true across the world, the, uh, the, the results of the literature? Um, so I, as I understand, so it's, so it's, has it happened only in Hawaii or other parts of the world as well? Is it? Uh, yeah, something, something of that. Okay, so yeah, this is something which came to, uh, so when I was studying Hawaiian birds with respect to malarial parasites, and the one of the quests which I was on was to understand that which host species brought the plasmodium parasite there and also where it came from. <laughs> the same answer we are asking for SARS-CoV-2. Um, uh, so uh, in order to understand that, we did a lot of survey, you know, we went we sampled something like 14,000 samples of birds we screened through, which were collected from different parts of the world and including other, uh, say, other Polynesian islands and Melanesian islands as well. And uh, what we found was very interesting that in an island setting, so for example, on Bermuda Island, whenever we sampled the birds, they all were prevalent or the only dominant parasite we found was the same as was on Hawaii. And same was in French Polynesia. So what made us think that because most of these islands have been colonized so far along with, by humans that probably that this parasite have played a role in the extinction of some of those uh, endemic birds there. But we are not really sure because it's been so far along. And the second thing is that because this Plasmodium relictum is, uh, is a very... They call it a shiva of all these uh, plasmodium parasites in, 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 in the world world because it's outcompete other parasites really uh, badly. It's a bit like Delta we have gone through in terms of SARS-CoV-2. It went through a quick sweep of human population and this is how plasmodium relictum is. When it is there in the population and those birds have very low immunity, that's what it does. Have. So we think this is what might have happened in some of those islands in the past. And this is why it has remained the dominant uh, parasite lineage, even now on those islands. Yeah. Thank you, Farah. Uh, so the next question is uh, from Sharda. She's asking, how come there are no antivirals for birds? Um, so in poultry farms, they do. Like in Europe and all, they do vaccinate the birds uh, in the poultry market because it's a very expensive business, right? So there's a very so in India they don't do that, as far as I understand. But in Europe, most of the farms are closed. They are contained. Unlike in India, we have most of the uh, poultry farms are open, right? Or sort of at the periphery of uh, between village and, you know, city line. But still quite open. But um, um, we don't do vaccination. But in, in abroad, they do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, the next, uh, Dr. Divya Pal is asking two sets of questions. First is... Uh, which part of body do mosquitoes bite in birds when they are like covered in feathers? And the second is, uh, do the malarial parasite follow a similar similar life cycle in birds as they do in humans? Yes, that's 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 a very good question. So yes, they do. So um, birds usually get bitten, say around their eyes, or 
the really non feather part which is the like the their toes and most of the time when they are say uh, roosting or uh, uh, nest site actually because that's where they tend to be quite stationary and they spend long hours um that's when they are really exposed to these different mosquito bites and other vector species as well and yes the life cycle of plasmodium is and uh, hemoprotea is pretty much the same as human malaria parasite it goes through the same phases yeah so birds are basically the uh mosquitoes are the obligatory host but birds are, but birds are the secondary host they just are the reservoir so but the sexual reproduction of the parasite takes place in mosquitoes yes uh so the next is very similar to what we you know, i think you've already answered is vaccination carried out in birds so it's an antiviral uh i'll i think i'll skip that and uh, the next is on the status of vulture and uh, are vultures impacted with diseases and what exactly is happening to them from, from a disease perspective <laughs> yeah um so the so the, the problem we have with vultures was not triggered by the diseases right i mean vultures have been actually affected by this diclofenac which is a anti inflammatory drug drug introduced in india long ago and uh, it's still practiced it's mainly given to the cows uh, when they grow old to when they are affected by arthritis so to relieve the pain and then vultures when they feed on these uh, dead cows who have been given this drug they can't uh, their system cannot cope with this drug uh, the anti uh, inflammatory most of the nsaids which are there in these uh, so vulture decline has not happened because of any kind of disease in fact uh, there was a study done uh, somewhere i think in central india or maharashtra side where somebody said that vultures have been found infected with some of the malaria parasites and it's just not possible i mean most of the birds in our indian subcontinent especially in the plains they have co evolved these parasites with these uh, malarial parasites and most of the parasites and i have sampled so many bird species by now and most of them are they do harbor these parasites the only thing is the system where you don't have these parasites and as i was just talking about in the himalayas or or maybe if there is a eruption of a, say uh, virus comes through then birds might be exposed so for example we do, we don't have any information on west nile virus we don't know what proportion of birds are carrying west nile virus we don't see so for example crows are the ones which are associated with that in north america people see a lot of dead crows and all we don't have this kind of information i think it would be nice to look into different viral diseases as well in the birds yeah so the next question bhagwant is trying to ask what are the guidelines for handling carcasses of birds basically dead birds and uh, yeah what protection can can yeah so i uh, well i suggest if you see dead birds and especially if it's around any lake area or anywhere i would not touch those birds with bare hand and utmost care i mean i would say you should wear a personal protective gear because you don't know what those birds might be carrying at the most people must wear mask and uh, gloves to protect themselves because you don't know what you might be you know inhaling as part of that thing unless you are really uh, i can imagine when bird watchers they are going around they do see tend to see dead birds and those can be valuable you know contribution in understanding what might be floating around but one has to be really really care careful and that goes for the when you are going to uh, any nest location or any caves as well where you see some of these birds nesting and all please wear mask don't don't take anything lightly you never know what they are infected with and same for the pigeons if you have pigeons nesting in your building and you have a lot of pigeon poop accumulating you must get that clean because inhaling some of those is also is it causing a huge problem in terms of lung diseases uh, lung fibrosis and all yeah nowadays yeah so deepa says uh, asking since birds have evolved for more than 50 million years uh, so do they have a better immune system compared to humans so um, uh, this is a very interesting question because um, uh, there is a book uh, called mosquitoes uh, which i was reading earlier um, it talks about the evolution of all the mosquitoes so birds uh, i mean as you know the living dinosaurs as we call right so dinosaurs have been 
found infected with different malarial parasites as well. This is much before the human malaria has evolved. So in some ways, human malaria has emerged or say it's a kind of a divergence from them, from an ancient lineage. So yeah, birds do have evolved and somehow they have a sort of relatively better immune system for some of these parasites, I would say. And it's just a matter of which species has not been exposed to which parasites and that becomes at the receiving end, you know, of the problem, yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, Sharda is trying to ask if birds uh, that are uh, sold in markets, uh, are they tested for parasites? I doubt, I don't know, I don't think so. <laughs> um, they should because they are living, I mean, you know, any bird market, the conditions are not very, great and um, yeah i think it would be interesting to see what is floating around there okay uh so the next question is a little now question i'll just read it out um any similarities in genetic host vector interaction when we compare recently diverged species such as short wings in Himalayas and shola Kilis in southwest in Kars? um that is a question which I, so or do differences arise due to microclimate etc changes like changes in microclimate etc um yeah i mean uh, so uh, yeah this is a good interesting question so so for example um i have sampled great barbet for example in in the western himalaya and then i have also sampled uh, white cheek barbet uh, or other species here in in southern india in bangalore and I found them carrying same parasite, which are actually fixed on very host specific for barbets. So how on earth that has happened considering those two areas are so far apart, that's very interesting for me to understand. And yet they also get infected with other parasites. So yeah, I think it's a combination of the microclimate where they are living and some of those species, they probably, the fixation of is this parasite become easier if they are in the same kind of habitat or same kind of climate, I should say. But it's not a very generalized pattern. You do see a mixed uh, switching of parasites also happening all the time. So yeah, it really, I think, driven by what kind of vector species are also um, present in that area. Thank you. Um, so uh, Dr. Dinefile is asking, or probably he's, uh, uh, I mean, he wants a, uh, Names of other bird diseases, both ecto or endoparasite, if possible. Yeah. So, uh, in terms of the ectoparasites, uh, so a lot of you know the the birds are infected with the fleas or uh, ticks and mites. And uh, one of the things, uh, so for example, we get in humans is the scrub typhus, which is a kind of fever. It's quite prevalent in in southern India, for example, people still don't know. They know you get it from mites, but people think that the birds could be the reservoir for some of these parasites, but it's usually transmitted by ticks. Um, in terms of endoparasites, birds do have things like uh, other kind of worms and things which, which, they, which they harbor. But usually a lot of protozoa and the spectrum of parasites, which I was talking, you know, initially in my first slide, like they have these trichomonoses, which, which is kind of a protozoan infection they tend to have or, or the pox viruses they get infected with. But they do harbor a, I would say other kind of, you know, blood parasites, which are not classified generally as malaria, but they just live with it. I mean, especially ducks and geese, have you, if you are a, for example, if you're catching ducks and geese, and if you ever find one which is dead, and if you see them inside, they are really infested with all kinds of parasites. And I think it really because of what they also feed on and what kind of habitat they harbor and they live in that sort of contributes to that as well. Yeah. I hope I answered your question. Uh, Sharda Uchil is uh, asking if uh, vaccination is cheaper than culling all the birds during flu. Okay. Yes, of course. I mean, uh, it's like letting people die of uh, COVID or is it better or we all get vaccinated? Of course. I mean, if they can vaccinate. So you know that people get flu shots, right? Every year. If I mean, I don't know. It's so prevalent in India. But say in Western world, people know. 
which every year they change the flu vaccine, right? Because depending on the which new strain is moving around in the population, it's the same for the avian influenza as well. So they, I mean, most of the industries, they know it's a multi million dollar industry having poultry farms. I mean, it's a big loss to the community. Did you see that figure of 80,000 crores I was showing you? It's a huge uh, amount of uh, money we are talking here. It's a big business. India is the second top country in egg production in the world. Can I tell you? It's going to be number one soon. So there is so much of business going on. And I think if vaccination is a small part of the thing and increasing the biosecurity, I mean, the amount of, say, for example, uh, destruction, these poultry farms sometimes, have, because there's no biosecurity, they just leave the garbage out, they, it destroys the nearby area. So in terms of hygiene and all, it promotes other diseases as well, you know, salmonella, and you just name it. So I think it needs to be handled in a better way to, in order for a, something like that to thrive and also to protect themselves and for the other species as well. So yeah, vaccination is definitely is, is the answer. And also surveillance apart from that, to know what's, you can vaccinate only when you know what virus you are up against basically. The next, uh, I mean, from Dr. Dipipal, he it's not exactly a question, but more like a, yeah, they I know Rani Keith has been, yeah. Yeah, okay. So anyway, so um, Rishika is asking, um, is there any disease ecology research done on short-range migrants like Kashmir flycatcher? Um, yeah, about uh, elevation and long-distance migrants. So to be honest, I would not <laughs> say it lightly, but in terms of disease ecology, we don't have many studies uh, in India. And I'll be delighted if anybody takes up more, you know, even if it's ectoparasites or different kinds of things, whether it's a surveillance thing. So, yeah, there is next to nothing uh, when you look at. So it's a field really waiting to be explored. And one doesn't have to solve too many problems. But even just to understand what kind of, say, parasite load is birds are carrying, what kind of different parasites, as you just asked me in this question, just simple thing or how that changes with the habitat or with their social behavior. Yeah, I think it'd be fantastic if we can dip into these questions more in a proper way and having a longitudinal study so we can understand the pattern, you know. Um, so Tastu uh, is asking if uh, most of these, uh, most of these, these diseases, uh, do they originate from uh, temperate zones? And if so, shouldn't the government be taking measure, measures? No, I will not say that they originate for temperate zone. I mean, we know they have come from there because there is more surveillance there, right? <laughs> I mean, for example, they said, um, uh, yeah, it's just something somebody's reporting a pathogen from there doesn't mean it's it has evolved from there or it is coming from there. It's just that they are more vigilant about it. It could be very much here as well. We didn't know. But the answer for that is only that the only way you can take a measure that you know what's floating in your population, right? And that can only be done when you're studying it, you are trying to know. Hmm. Uh, so, I mean, Kaspar is again asking if uh, we need to be careful when we are studying bats and uh, do humans have a high chance of contracting disease from bats? Um, yes, I mean, I know why you're asking this question because of the <laughs> SARS-CoV-2. So may I just say, but most of the bats, they do carry these viruses. They have always have, they have evolved with these viruses. They do shed, but that doesn't mean most of them are lethal to us or they will jump host. I mean, um, uh, but yes, I would say one needs to be very careful when, because with all the change in, you know, land habitat use, most of the, when the habitat is changing, their, the bats roosting and resting habitat has also been disturbed. So they tend to say roost and come very close to the human habitation. And uh, you see them around more than ever. So I would say one needs to be a bit careful. I mean, especially if places like uh, Kerala where they had Nipah outbreak and all that, one needs to be, yeah. I think the answer for all of this is just that one needs to be very vigilant. What you are, it's just not that, oh yeah, this is what it is, but that doesn't mean one should panic also, yeah. I would say knowledge is power and the more you know, you know what you're, how to handle it. So uh, Deepak is trying to ask if there have been cases where wild wet, wetland birds have been culled because of a disease outbreak. Uh, no, not that I'm aware of. In most of the cases, when you have any kind of this 
avian influenza happening, most of the birds, they die on their own. Yeah. And those probably who are, have, can sustain or they are just coping with, they do, they tend not to fly. They just are shedding the viruses basically. Yeah. Uh, so uh, very similar, uh, on a very similar line, are birds in wild habitats treated for diseases? Uh, no, they are not. I mean, even for malaria, people have done experiments. Say, for example, in UK, they try to give them anti-malarial drug to understand, does it reduce the load of, say, plasmodium or some other parasites? But you can't, you can't treat every bird for a disease like that. What you can do, you can prevent it. I mean, if, as I said, if avian influenza is a huge problem when you have a lot of poultry farms reporting it, right? So not to have them in the main city areas, have them outskirts have better surveillance, understand what's going on, vaccinate the chickens, clean, keep the habitat clean, reduce the exposure to the humans or human or this wild uh, waterfowl interface. Those measures can help. I think, I think that was the last question, Farah. Oh, right. Okay. Everyone. Thank you. I enjoyed uh, talking to you guys. And I hope I wasn't speaking too fast. <laughs>